everybody. Today's guest is Clint Herbert, former Indianapolis Indian, former big league player, and former minor and major league manager. We'll be back with Clint after these words. today's guest, former Major League player, former Indianapolis Indian, former Major and Minor League Manager. Clint, how are you doing? Good morning, Howard. I'm well. I'm doing very well. Thanks for uh, reaching out to me. That's terrific. Before we get to your managerial career, you played a number of years. You were in one World Series. You did very well in that. What are your thoughts when you look back to your playing days? Oh, wow. Um, I get some broad strokes for that when I, you know, I'm really happy that it happened. Um, I'm thankful and grateful for all the different experiences. Um, at the end of the day, it's a very select group of men that have been to a world series as a player, 1980 with the Royals as a coach, 2010 with the Rangers hitting coach. And then as a manager, uh, 2007 with the Rockies, small group, you know what a smaller group is than that, Howard? I finished, second, I finished second three times, all three oh, wow. times. <laughs> it went well. It, you, I think you won something like five for 12 in the 1980 World Series. You did very well. Take us back to that season, and that was the year of George Brett. It was all about George that year. We had a very talented team, um, but George was the deal. I mean, late, early September, late August, he's still hitting 400. Um, and it was just amazing to watch this man go out there, you know, almost every day. He was on the DL at one time. I think he drove in 117 runs in 116 games that he played that year. He was on the DL maybe a couple times. Uh, just phenomenal player. Um, batting, left-handed, right-handed, hard, soft, didn't matter what they threw up there. He, he, could, he could absolutely, you know, find hits. And, and over the fence, in front of the fence, Whitey used to say if you threw him a snowball on, on Christmas day, he'd hit a line drive. Uh, it was, he went on one road trip. Gosh, I want to think what might've been that year. I think he went like six games in a row, three for four, every game. I had never seen anything like this. You know, I was a pretty good player at lower levels and in the big leagues, you try and find your own way, but to play at that level and watch what this guy's performance, it was like he was in a league of his own. It was absolutely sensational. And I learned something from him. I was fairly young. So were you at the time? But he said afterward, I think he was hitting in mid-September, or as you said, early September, he was hitting 400. And then he said, and then I started trying to hit 400 and put undue pressure on himself. I can't imagine. That's rare air. I don't know what it would be like to try and hit 400. I stress out trying to hit 300. Huh. And so did a lot of other guys. You know, I'll give you one more crazy statistic from that season, Howard. He popped up in the infield for outs five times the entire year, only five infield pop-ups. I can remember games where I might've had two or three in one game, the entire season over 400 summit bats, 450 at bats, four or five balls popped up in the infield. He just squared everything up. He was just a, such a talented hitter. And a lot of it. Born skills, inherent skills, but he was an extremely hard worker and he worked extremely hard on both sides of the ball. He actually won a gold glove one point in time in his career as well. He was never satisfied with where he was at. He was always looking to better himself. And the lesson learned was don't try too hard. Don't put undue pressure on yourself because the biggest mistake a hitter can make is not to trust his hands and a pitcher not to trust his stuff. What's well, so true. And I, you know, there might just be part of that where, you know, George finally showed some human side to him in, in, in early September because what he was doing was crazy. And for him, I, I can remember when he said that, he goes, geez, all of a sudden it just caught up on me that I'm actually trying to get hits now. All I ever, all I did all year was just look for a good pitch, hit the ball hard where it's pitch. All the stuff you talk to little leaguers, right? Hit it back through the middle, hit it hard where it's pitch. That's what he was doing and doing it better than anybody else. 1982, you played with the Indianapolis Indians. They won a championship. I remember your three-run homer in game six. But I'll also remember the fact that you had the best day of any player, and I've been here over 40 years now, of any player because of when you hit your two home runs. The Indians were down 5 nothing. 
It was a Saturday night against Evansville. They're battling for first place. They're down five, nothing. You doubled and scored the first run down five to one. You hit a grand slam off Dave Moore to tie the game at five down two runs in the bottom of the ninth with two outs. You hit a three run homer off Kevin Soche. He was a lefty, he kept throwing you away and you adjusted and went, went to left center field. That was absolutely incredible. You know, make sure you tell that story to Brian Esposito at some point in time, this homestander, when he gets back in town. Well, John, I'd appreciate that. He's a very good friend of mine. Um, he's a good man to have run that ball club. But you know what? Sometimes there, there's bittersweet moments in your life, and it was obviously bitter to get sent down from the big league club. Uh, I was fortunate, though. Every time I was sent down, I, I fell into a good group of men, young men. And to have George Sugar, as crazy it was, run that club that year, I mean, he was the he was the right guy for the job. He was no nonsense. We did things the Reds way. And I think also either he closed his ears or turned his back enough to let us kind of do our thing. Uh, but it was a good group of players. Asaski was on that club. Tommy Foley, uh, Tom Foley, Tommy Lawless, you know, the pitchers that were on that club. Um, Gary Reedus, but a lot of the pitchers, even Billy Shearer, uh, Shearer, who I still, you know, run into the ballparks today as a scout, but so many good men, so much fun. It was just a talented team that loved playing the game, and we kind of bonded together, and we turned a, you know, a situation that can be hard and triple it into a lot of fun for everybody. Winning that whole thing was, was a blast. And what made it even more challenging, now you were allowed to use the designated hitter during the uh, championship series against Omaha, but most of that season, the Indians were batting the pitcher while the opposition was hitting the des using the designated hitter. Yeah, we would we would uh, let our pitchers know that, you know, if you guys just want to get really crazy, you know, throw out one hit tonight. Just help us a little bit because they didn't do it. You know, you hit as much as you can with the pitchers, but geez, limited staff. The pitchers didn't get that much hitting training, but we just did the best we could with what we had. And we found ways to do it. You know, we we had a good lineup. Um, Nick, how about how about remember Neil Fiala? I mean, guys sure. were coming bench and doing things for us as well that were very productive so we got contributions from everybody all over the place just a fun club to be a part of you played several more years after that and then when your playing days ended or you were close to them ending i know dave rosenfield the longtime general manager of the norfolk tides had a good influence on you and you spoke with him and tell us about your relationship with him and what he said to you well dave was dave another bittersweet moment i been told I'd made the major league club in Seattle the day before opening day. And then opening day, I go to the park and I'm there early. And all of a sudden I get a tap on the shoulder. One of the coaches said, uh, Mr. Gorman needs to see upstairs. And I think, well, of course he does. He's I got to sign a contract. It's opening day. Well, I went up and was informed that I didn't make the club and they were sending me out to try and get a job in the minor leagues. Opening day in the big leagues was very challenging as, as things happen. Uh, the Mets had some interest. Uh, at AAA, Davey Johnson was the manager. Dave Rosenfield was the general manager. He called me up and said, hey, we're going to make a spot for you. We need you to get here by Norfolk, you know, in, by Tuesday. And I think it was Sunday or maybe Saturday. Whatever I got sent down, I had like 48 hours to get from Seattle to Norfolk. And my car was already being driven up to Seattle. So I had to redirect my car full of stuff, catch a flight, get there. And the craziest thing was, as I walked into the Norfolk it was actually the Tidewater Tides office. Another guy was walking out. As I walked in, Dave Rosenfield goes, wow, that was crazy. And I'm like, what? He goes, well, that was uh, Ronald McDonald, true name. We just released him to make room for you. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. You know, here I come in. That guy's going out. He was told he got let go. Dave said, hey, look, you got a fresh start. Make the most of it. Have some fun. We need, we've got some older guys that have been around in this club. Davey Johnson's the manager. Find a way to have some fun, Clint. He goes, it looks like you haven't had a whole lot of fun lately. Find some fun. Dave and I became lifetime friends, uh, great friends. And that built my relationship with Davey Johnson. I think on that club, Howard, I'm going to take you around the horn. Dave, uh, Gary Razich at first base, Wally Backman at second, Ron Gardenhire at third. At short, I played third. Uh, Mike Fitz Fitzgerald caught, Ron Reynolds caught. All these guys ended up in the big leagues. Rusty Tillman, Marvell Wynn, Daryl Strawberry in the outfield. It was a Ron Darling, Tom Gorman. I mean, Timmy, uh, I'm trying to think of the guy that pitched with the, with, with the Dodgers. Um, no, Leary. Too no, a different one, Leary. 
Um, just a great club. We won it all that year too. It was actually when they had the uh, the extended playoff where all three minor league organizations got together and played. So a lot of fun. We'll have more with Clint Hurdle after these messages. your lifetime friendship with with uh, longtime Norfolk and Tidewater general manager Dave Rosenfield. Did he influence you in terms of you becoming a manager and staying in the game? You know, he had a couple conversations along the way about that. Um, Dave was down in the clubhouse from time to time. He asked me what my thoughts were. Um, you know, and I kept kind of telling him my thoughts were in playing, uh, hanging on and playing more. And he said, well, there may come a day where that, that looks, that doesn't look as bright as something else. He goes, I think you got a good mind. I think with all the life experiences you got, I think you'd have an opportunity to teach and help some younger players along the way. He said, why don't you just put in your pocket and think about managing or coaching somewhere down the road. Eventually it all came to fruition. I can remember Steve Shriver was running the Mets Meyer league system at the time. And it's kind of funny how I got my first managerial job in St. Lucie. Florida State League, that's a high level to start at, but I kept threatening to play. Steven said he called me up one winter, so he offered me a job in, in rookie ball up in Glen Falls, New York, and I told him, man, I'm really humbled. That's a very nice offer. Thank you very much, but I know you have a team in Port St. Lucie you're going to open up with. That's a job I prefer. <laughs> he said a bunch of things, and one of them was, you're not ready for that. You've got work to do. Forget about it. No chance. Okay, 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 Steve. I get it. I'm going to play. Two weeks later, okay. We can't send you there, but we've got Lynchburg. It's a higher level of rookie ball. We can send you there and start your managerial career there. I go, oh, wow, that's really nice. Thanks. No, not Port St. Lucie's too close. And he told me why I was making a mistake. Another call, another same situation. Finally called me back. This is gone going about a month. He goes, so you're telling me if you can manage that St. Lucie club, you'll retire. And I said, Steve, only good players retire. I said, people are stopping, stop, starting to not call me anymore. I think I can get a job. Maybe, maybe not. But if you that St. Lucie thing's open up, yes, I'll stop playing and, and I'll be your manager. And then he offered me the job. And that's actually when I started my managerial career in the Florida State League. By threatening to continue to play, I got my first opportunity to manage. And you got to the AAA level and became a coach with Colorado. Before we get to that, don't you think it meant a great deal to you to learn things as a minor league manager? Nowadays, a number of guys have gone right to the big leagues as a manager with no managerial experience. Well, it's not for me to decide other people's job, who, who other people want to hire for their man. I needed every game I had in the minor leagues. I, I managed for six years in the minor leagues. I was a hitting coordinator for the Rockies for three years in the minor leagues. Um, I rode buses again after riding buses as a player, uh, learning the trade, learning uh, what the job requirements I felt were needed. I was fortunate to be taught at the knee of Daryl Johnson, former big league skipper in the Mets organization. He would come and spend a week at a time with the managers and just watch you. Wasn't there to see players. He'd watch the manager and give them input, share, share stories, experiences. Um, so I needed all the time. I think one of the things you have seen in a lot of these situations is eventually it can catch up to you, especially in today's game. When you're talking about putting 150 to $200 million payroll out there with a guy that maybe only has no experience or one year of experience, you're entrusting the keys to a pretty nice car to a guy that's just got his license, you know, basically. And I think you're seeing some of that come back around where, you know, I won't say there's buyer's remorse, but they're finding out there may be a little bit more to it than they anticipated coming in the door. Take us back to the day you got the Rockies job. What were your feelings? Oh, my gosh. I actually got a call from Dan O'Dowd, and I thought he was coming to my house to fire me. He called me up that morning. He said, I need to talk to you. And we had been, we were 10, we were, I think we were 18 and 28. And we weren't hitting. We were playing poorly. We had it on a losing streak. I was in charge of the offense. I was helping with the outfielders. We dropped multiple balls in the outfield. Dallas Williams was our outfield coach at that time. Buddy and I remember, you remember Dallas. He was on that team. Yeah. Um, so I thought 
Dan was coming to my house. He said, I want to meet you at home. I don't want you to come. I don't want to talk about this in the park. I'm like, this may be cool because normally you get fired or you get sent down. It's at the park and you got to make that walk of shame out of the clubhouse carrying a bag. So I'm thinking, I called my dad saying, dad, I think the GM's coming over to fire me. Well, Dan came over and told me that you know, he was going to let somebody go, but it wasn't going to be me. He wanted to know if I had any thoughts, if I would be willing to be interim manager for the ball club. So my whole day flipped 180 degrees the other way. And it was exciting. It was, I was scared. Um, you know, there's all the minor league got jobs I had done, even the games, but now it's the real thing. And I had to call my dad back and said, no, I didn't get fired. As a matter of fact, you guys need to get on the flight and make it here for the second game I'm going to manage as a major league manager. And my dad's like, what? Major league manager? So, yeah, that's how it all started. And little did I know that I'd end up managing and coaching in the big leagues more time than I ever did playing. And it became something that, as I look back, I'm very grateful and thankful for. There were some proud moments along the way because I think in each instance, I was able to help the organization I worked with and for at the time become better during the course of, of the time I was there with the people that I was working with. Take us back to that incredible run in 2007 the Rockies had late in the season. <coughs> Pardon me. We, we went 13 out of 14. You know, we weren't ever bad all year. We hung around 500 all year, and I kept just telling the guys, you know something? We haven't even been hot yet. We haven't even been hot yet. Well, we got two weeks to play. We still haven't been hot yet. We got hot the last two weeks of the season. We won 13 out of 14. We were six and a half games out with 14 to play. We made up all that tough room. We go to game 163. It goes in the 13th inning. Uh, we give up a two-run homer, and somehow, some way, we score three off Trevor Hoffman, the, one of the best closers in the history of the game, to win, you know, to, to win the wild card game. We get in the wild card, we get in the playoffs, then we run the table. We sweep Philly in three. We swept the Diamondbacks in four. We won 21 out of 22 games to get to the World Series. But it was an incredible experience. The guys on the team showing up early, staying late. Somebody new every night shows up in a different way to help us. It was just one of those things that you always hear about. It took all of us, and it wasn't the way we drew it up, but it was incredibly fun, almost like a father watching his kids play in the backyard and just every night just shaking his head going, wow, they're doing pretty good. A few years later, you get the Pirates job in 2011. The first two years, you got off to good starts. The team didn't do as well in the second half. But then 2013, after 20 years of not being in, having a winning record, actually, the Pirates not only have a winning record, you get to the postseason. Take us back to those moments. Another chilling, you know, just a chilling experience. I can remember when I took the job, was offered the job, and um, I said one of our one of our goals is to rebond a city with a with this ball team because it had lost touch, it lost 212 games in the 2010, uh, 2009, and 2010 seasons, 212 losses. As you said, first two years, good fights. As a matter of fact, every year that I was a part of that organization, nine straight first halves, we were in the running at the end of the first half. Different reasons why we didn't finish the way we wanted to. But that year, we got better as the season went on. I think the lessons learned in the first two years. You got to be strong. You got to be tough. You got to have depth. Um, we did. We did those things. And I think the lessons learned kind of you get knocked off the playground. What are you going to do when you get knocked off the playground? You're going to go tell your dad. You're going to have somebody else fight your fighter. You're going to fight your way back on the playground. Our players bonded together. We pitched it extremely well. We played very good defense and we found ways to get hits when we needed to. And to have that experience, 20 consecutive losing seasons, we snapped that. 21 years without a playoff game, snapped that. And to get in that wild card game and to have the blackout. And then for our fans to show up the way they did, to show off our ball, our ballpark. And then to na 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 Cueto off the mountain to drop the ball and Russell Mark hit the next pitch and he picks the ball up off the ground in the bleachers. Just fantastic memories. Fantastic. What was really great, too, is even though you didn't win the wild card games the next two years, you made the postseason the next two years. So you had three straight seasons of going to the postseason. We did, and, and it was hard. In, in, in 14, it's hard. It's one and done, and you fight 162 games for that opportunity, and then you face somebody like uh, Bumgarner. Little did we know, starting with that game, 
How many scoreless innings did he throw? I mean, the rest, I mean, it's one of the most remarkable playoff experiences any pitcher's ever had in the history of the game. It started with us. And we run into that guy for that game and we're out. I can remember having a conversation with my dad. My dad's going, geez, what are the chances of you having to face the Cy Young Award winner in a wild card game? I go, I know, that was tough. It'll never happen again. Well, what happens in 2050? <laughs> we run into Arietta, who's having one of the best seasons a pitcher could ever have in Cubs history. And the same thing happens. You win 98 games and you get one shot and you're out. So tough to swallow, but that's the way it was drawn up. But it was incredible for the city, the fans, the employees to have that time and space together, I think, to really appreciate and, and to love on their ball club and for baseball to become a big deal in Pittsburgh again. Well, Clint, I thank you so much for taking time out to speak. And also, I congratulate you on everything you've achieved over the years, both in your professional life and with your family and your personal life. Howard, you're a good friend. We've known each other a long time. Anything I can ever do to help you out, please let me know. My best to you and Robin. Know that I love you, buddy. Be well. Same here. And I will say you are a good friend, too. And we go back to April of 1977. We met when you were playing in Omaha. That's this a little while ago. We got a couple years under our belts. <laughs> Thanks again, Clint. We'll have more after these words. Special thanks to our guest, Clint Hurdle. We'll see you next week, everybody.